Hello, everyone. This is Alfred Weaver, Professor of Computer Science at the University of Virginia, and it's my honor to be the co-guest editor with uh, Ray Bryce of this special issue of Computer Magazine, in which we're featuring some interesting papers about the medical scene. And the one that we're going to discuss now is called The Chills and Thrills of Whole Genome Sequencing. So we have with us on the line today a couple of experts in that area. I'm going to uh, give them a one-sentence introduction and then let them tell you more about their background. And then I have some questions that I hope we can discuss. Uh, so uh, first uh, of our uh, two guests is Dr. Bradley Malin uh, from uh, Vanderbilt University. Brad, would you tell us a bit about yourself, please? Sure. Uh, I'm a professor of computer science as well as biomedical informatics and am affiliated faculty in the Center for Biomedical Ethics and Society at Vanderbilt University. Uh, at the university, I investigate privacy issues both from a technical as well as a computational aspect with respect to all sorts of personal information, including genomics. Okay, thanks. And our second guest is Dr. Jacques Fillet, uh, in, who's with us from Lausanne, Switzerland. We appreciate your being with us today. Jacques, could you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, hi. So I'm an assistant professor at uh, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, EPFL, and I'm a medical doctor by initial training, and then I went into human genomics research. And now my research is at the crossroad between uh, genomics and infectious diseases on the one hand. And on the other hand, I started collaborating with people in the computer science department of my institution here to uh, start uh, diving into this new area of uh, genomic privacy uh, two, three years ago. All right. Um, thank you. And now we'll get into some of the questions. This first question is going to be uh, directed to both of you. Jacques, I'll ask you to answer first and Brad second. Uh, this article that we're talking about, the chills and thrills of whole genome sequencing, brings up a whole lot of issues, particularly with regard to privacy and privacy in the, in the context of human genomic information. Uh, so, Jacques, which issues and challenges stood out to you that were uh, raised in this article? So, I think the major challenge for um, for human genomics, when uh, considered from the perspective of privacy, is to find the right balance between utility and privacy. And we are in a setting where it's almost impossible to start sacrificing. Uh, utility because if you so think about personalized medicine genomic based medicine you don't want to uh, get some more privacy because you decrease the quality of the actual information you get uh, and that you want to use for for clinical care so that's uh, that's a balance that needs to be found but it's much more difficult than in other fields because you cannot really start touching utility and I think that's, that's central to the discussion that is in this paper. And Brad, uh, what did you see as the issues and challenges that stood out to you? So the number one issue has to do with the pricing associated with the technology that we're talking about. The, the notion of genomics, the notion of sequencing individuals has been around for on the order of 40 to 50 years. I think that we're at a situation where the cost associated with using high throughput sequencing technologies has made it feasible for individuals to become consumers of the technology and generate their own data and take it out of the hands out of uh, what used to be a very um, research-oriented only environment. So price is one aspect. The second aspect is is that you you now have a situation where you are using this type of data for all sorts of purposes, ranging from ancestry investigations to treating individuals uh, in a clinical sense to uh, un understanding just uh, the potential for um, either uh, how you're going to respond to particular pharmaceuticals or the likelihood that you're going to contract a particular disorder. 
Um, so, so whole genome sequencing has really opened up this doorway of, so now, what do you do when the data is available on everyone and is quite easy to move around? Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Jacques, since you are a, a genomic researcher, I'll ask you this next question. Uh, what do you think are the biggest advances that uh, you think we'll see in the next five years? So with regard to DNA sequencing and beyond, uh, Brad already alluded to uh, the biggest change will be the globalization or democratization of genomic information. Today it is still exceptional for a patient to be in the hospital with any genetic information. Tomorrow, and five years is quite far away, I would say even before five years, we'll start having uh, genetic and genomic information uh, in most cases. And that will be part of the standard um, in the hospitals and outside of hospitals because, of course, it won't be limited to medical, it will be health, and it will be also recreational genomics. So uh, the major change will be that uh, genomics will be everywhere. So this is all due to advances in technology, in uh, computing power, in how to treat this data. But the net result will be that uh, data will be there, and it will, won't be an option to ignore it. Mm, thank you. Um, Brad, since you do work in, in uh, policy matters, let me ask you this next question. What do you think are the privacy policy mi milestones that you think we'll see in the future? Well, let's take a step back and say, what do I think will happen as opposed to what I believe needs to happen? Um, one of the biggest challenges, at least in the United States, that we're going to run into with respect to privacy and genomics is that currently, uh, we have regulation on the books in the form of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that limits the extent to which genomic data can be used um, for employment uh, as well as uh, health care insurance operations. So it, it really provides some protection in that regard. Uh, however, at the same time, it does not actually cover all potential uses of genomic data. Uh, so for instance, it doesn't necessarily cover life insurance and the extent to which you can discriminate against somebody in that regard. Um, so we've, we've had this act on the books for probably around eight years at this point. I believe it came out in 2007. Um, but it, it clearly doesn't go far enough. Um, it, in many respects, it's an exceptionalistic type of regulation uh, or protection. Um, so. It's one thing that, that needs to change. Uh, the extent to which it will change is debatable. It's very difficult to change policy in that regard. Uh, the second thing that is going to probably happen is that you're going to see uh, it, a situation in which you have a technology that is consumerized and it's no longer just health-related, as we were alluding to before. Uh, as a result, the, the, the oversight with respect to genomic data uh, in terms of what you can and can't do with it and how you actually regulate its commerce and, and is, is there's, there's probably going to be a particular agency within the United States that is going to take this on. Whether or not it will be the Federal Trade Commission or Health and Human Services remains to be seen. Wow, that's uh, that's a, a huge responsibility for whoever does take this on. I, I wish them well in advance. Uh, let me change gears just a little bit, and Jacques, let me ask you this question. Uh, this is about the genetic testing service uh, that uh, goes by the name of 23andMe, who's uh, recently, and there's some stories about how people have used that service to estimate their risk of disease, and some people who've even uh, uh, received an early diagnosis of a serious disease. And that's clearly uh, related to privacy policy issues. Uh, and I know because you told me so that uh, this service, 23andMe, you, you have been a, or you are a customer there. Um, and even though that service is temporarily unavailable due to concerns, do you think that uh, the positives of such a service will outweigh the negatives? 
So there are different um, different levels uh, to such a service, and, and 23andMe is just the best known example of what is uh, known as uh, DTC for direct to consumer genomics. And uh, it's true, I, I sent um, some of my biological material to get this uh, readout of the genetic variation that is present in my genome out of interest, uh, because that's that's what I do on a daily basis, and I was interested uh, in knowing what what is accessible for for every everybody on earth just by sending hundred dollar and uh, and and a little bit of material so I think that it has a huge advantage is to empower people to make people interested in something that will impact them anyway uh, here they choose to be impacted it can in some instances be a little bit um, hard for people to understand all the different levels of genetic information that they get back. And that's the paternalistic slash protectionist slash justified uh, view from the medical field where many people are worried to give too much information to people that are not prepared to digest it. And, uh, and that's a reasonable fear, I think. Um, I'm inclined to think that people are um, smart enough or uh, careful enough to be uh, aware that what they get back uh, has to be interpreted and to ask for help in case they need it. And that's why I'm personally uh, thinking that it is great that such services uh, exist. They have to be done in a way that is reliable, and that's one of the problems uh, that was um, one of the questions that FDA asked 23andMe. So, is your test really reliable? Are the results you give really the actual results from the patient? Do you have to, can you prove that? So, that's a technical issue that has to be demonstrated. And then there is a whole field of interpretation of genomic data that is blooming now, that is only starting, I would even say, from a research perspective. And um, I think that having an army of empowered uh, citizens knowing what we're talking about will be precious because uh, there is an important issue with everything that relates to genomics. Uh, you don't want genomics to be left to doctors and scientists only. You want it to be a societal issue that many people are able to discuss and tackle. Oh, thanks. Okay, one last question for both of you. Uh, this is a, a question about uh, technology. Um, what are some of the most important open questions in this article that you believe that we as technologists really need to address in the future? So, Brad, I'll ask you first. Sure. I believe there's two that I'll start with. Uh, the first one is, to what extent can all uses associated with genomic data be managed in a similar format? What I mean by this is that there's a major distinction between genomic data that is being used by investigators or scientists who are trusted to do so versus individuals who may be anywhere in the world and have zero relationship to the scientific enterprise. Now, this is one of the most challenging aspects because it assumes that you should be uh, tailoring privacy protection technologies to the trustworthiness of the individuals who are involved. Uh, and the extent to which that can be accomplished, that is an open question. So in the, situ the second issue is the extent to which we can formalize the processes around the use of genomic data. So when you can formalize how you um, use the data either for a consumer-related purpose or for even a scientific investigation, then you have the ability to automate the processing of it. And in doing so, you take out the ad hoc viewing and sharing and reuse of the data, which makes it much more easy to manage and provide privacy proofs around. The, the final issue that, that I would bring up is that there are many emerging technologies such as uh, secure multi-party computation that allow you to do analysis of any type of data, genomic data included, without disclosing what the actual information is. 
as such, you may be able to do, for instance, aggregate analyses or statistical computations over the data and look for associations or relationships that does not disclose what any particular individual actually had. The challenge here is that you assume exactly what you're going to be doing with the data. And so if you tailor the cryptography to a specific process and then you change that process, you have to go back and do full redesign of the entire cryptographic mechanism, which people may not want to do. As a result, they may not want to adopt that technology in the first place. Thus, you don't necessarily have the strongest amount of privacy set in place. So that's one of the, or three of the major challenges as I see them. Oh, that's a great answer, thank you. So, Jacques, what do you think that uh, we as technologists uh, need to be addressing in the future? I'll be less detailed than Brad, but I, I think there is one thing that is very specific to, the, to DNA, to genomic information, and that makes it a very interesting challenge for people in the field is the longevity of the data. We are not talking here of data that... Um, will be uh, obsolete five years from now. So genomic data is, um, at, at the basis, it is irrevocable, meaning that it is not only um, important for the life of the individual, but also for his offspring. So if there is leakage of information, it's once and forever, because um, you cannot just reset uh, and, and start again. So this longevity of data changes the way you have to approach it from a privacy perspective because it has it has to be safe uh, for for a very long time and uh, related to that there is a virtual impossibility to uh, totally anonymize the, the, the genomic data because it is in itself the best identification um, the best id for any individual on this planet so those two issues together makes it a very specific case for privacy researchers and there is one thing that is not a question for technologists, but I think it's a question for all human beings today that will be confronted with genomics, is the question of uh, who owns the genetic data, not only between patients and doctors, but inside families. So can I publicize my genetic data without asking permission from all my relatives? And that's also a re an important question for, uh, for uh, research uh, projects going on. So all that together makes it a very fascinating field. Oh, I'd have to agree. That is fascinating and a little bit scary, which is why we're concerned about these privacy issues. Well, I want to thank both of you, uh, Brad and Jock, for an excellent interview. I appreciate hearing your views on these subjects. And to all of our listeners, thank you for listening to our interview. Uh, thank you again, and goodbye. Goodbye.